Good evening, everyone. Welcome to tonight's webinar, A Window of Opportunity, hosted by the Nature Conservancy, or TNC. I'm Lori Brennan, the Executive Director for the Nature Conservancy in Pennsylvania and Delaware, and thank you so much for joining us. Offshore wind is in the news and on the minds of many these days. It's a complex topic at the intersection of science, policy, economics, and community perceptions. And we acknowledge that there are many moving pieces among conservation groups, offshore wind companies, state and local agencies, clean energy advocacy groups, and the federal government. And there's a lot of misinformation circulating out there, and it can often be hard to sort fact from fiction. But one thing is clear. We know that we must reduce greenhouse gas emissions if we're to limit the impacts of climate change. Clean energy can help safeguard our natural heritage. In Delaware, our unique natural environments, the bays, tidal marshes, dunes, and freshwater wetlands are home to rare, threatened, or endangered plant and animal life, including the globally recognized horseshoe crab and migrating red knot. Last year, with support of the Nature Conservancy and others in the conservation community, Delaware's legislature set a goal to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 50% by 2030 and achieve net zero by 2050. We cannot meet state emissions reduction goals without offshore wind energy. At TNC, we believe that a science-based approach is critical. We support the rapid and sustainable development of renewable energy projects that avoid potential impacts to habitat and species via the best available data. We also believe that engaging with key stakeholders in the community is key to achieving durable and equitable policy. We know that together we'll find a way. So I'm very grateful to have a panel of colleagues with me tonight who will discuss all things offshore wind and help us dive deeper into this important topic. Uh, Judy Dunscombe is the Senior Conservation Scientist for TNC in Virginia, and her work fo focuses on the intersection of policy and science. In her more than 28 years with TNC, Judy has worked extensively in strategic conservation and business planning, including freshwater impacts from conventional and renewable energy development. We asked Judy to join us today to share about Virginia's experiences as we start the offshore wind con conservation conversation for Delaware. Emily Neural is the Director of Government Relations and External Affairs for TNC in Delaware. She is our staffer on the ground, working on conservation and clean energy, including offshore wind, and brings over 30 years of experience in Delaware public policy to the Nature Conservancy. She's been working with the Delaware Clean Energy Coalition, conservation advocates, legislature, and state agencies on strategies to expand clean energy opportunities in Delaware. As we get started, um, Oh, sorry. Um, we also have Trish Yadell, who's our offshore wind policy manager. And the spirit of going live, I will just tell you that Trish's bio has disappeared from my talking points. So I am extremely uh, apologetic. Trish has an extensive um, background as an attorney, and she guides um, the Nature Conservancy's offshore wind work at the global and national level. So as we get started, I invite you to submit questions for the panelists at any time using the chat feature in the lower right hand corner of your screen. And we'll collect these questions backstage and we'll reserve time to answer several of them towards the end of our program. Uh, throughout, throughout now, without further ado, I will turn things over to Tricia to get us started. Great, thanks. Thanks, Lori. I'm um, gonna jump right into the um, next slide. Uh, and Lori's already touched on this a little bit, but I think it's important to kind of ground our conversation today to talk about why offshore wind is a conservation issue and why TNC is working on it. Um, the Paris Climate Treaty was adopted by 196 nations in Paris, France, 
nearly 10 years ago. This legally binding treaty says that based on climate science, we need to keep the global average temperature increase to no more than 1.5 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels. That crossing this, this particular threshold will unleash um, severe climate change impacts, including extraordinary biodiversity loss and risking the health and safety of billions of people. So when you hear language that talks about reaching net zero by 2050, that is a target that's linked to this specific temperature threshold. We are presently on a path to a global temperature increase of four degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels, which would make the planet uninhabitable. And we are experiencing right now unprecedented um, global biodiversity loss as a result of climate change. Next slide. In order to achieve its conservation objectives, TNC established these 2030 goals. All of our conservation work is in service to these goals. The relevant offshore wind goals are climate, ocean, and people. So to achieve three gigatons of carbon dioxide removed every year by 2030, we have to rely in part on renewable energy deployment. But because we also have ocean protection goals, this means that we have to build that as we build offshore wind, we have to do our best to make sure that we aren't contributing to further biodiversity loss and that we're protecting at-risk ocean habitat and also where we can enhancing habitat and biodiversity. And also let's not forget about people. Offshore wind presents many opportunities to reduce pollution and health burdens, um, create new jobs and community benefits and it gives us the opportunity to do this in a way that gives ocean users and rights holders a uh, important voice in the in the process. But um, next slide. So offshore wind is this even a form of renewable energy that's worth our time and effort? That's a that's a good question and a and a right question to ask. This map produced by the National Renewable Energy Laboratory and Department of Energy shows the role of offshore wind relative to other forms of renewable energy and relative to location. The wind is shown in blue and the darker the color, the greater the potential. You can see that offshore wind is a critical piece to the climate mitigation puzzle because it's located near densely populated areas with high energy demands and space limitations and it's also demonstrated that off the Atlantic coast in particular, the wind is stronger than almost anywhere else in the world. And importantly, that it's strongest and most consistent during the winter when we will need it most for um, heating. Um, if you could just push the space bar. Um, the US Department of Energy's estimated technical resource potential for offshore wind exceeds 4,000 gigawatts. And to put that in, a per in perspective, um, this is three times the country's electricity demand today. Um, and one more, if you could hit the space bar one more time. Despite the potential, the federal goals on offshore wind are relatively small, 30 gigawatts by 2030 and 110 gigawatts by 2050. And this is especially um, conspicuous when viewed in contrast to state offshore wind goals. Next slide. Most states on the Atlantic coast have established climate mitigation and decarbonization goals into state law. Many of them have statutory mandates to achieve these goals by certain dates. They have also invested in decarbonization strategies that tell them how much wind they need to achieve their net zero by 2050 goals. Almost all of the states on the Atlantic coast have specific offshore wind goals. My colleague, Emily Neural is gonna talk about the news from Delaware on this front. Um, so I'll leave that for now, but for now on this chart, it's still listed here as zero. State goals um, are a signal to offshore wind companies that they are possible buyers of offshore wind energy. And these goals also inform the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management's decisions about where leases are needed. While states set up the process for energy buying, the federal government has the primary responsibility for leasing, environmental review, and permitting. Offshore wind projects require roughly 60 permits from um, state, federal, and sometimes even local um, agencies before construction can begin. Next slide. 
The Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, or BOEM, as we refer to it, is under the Department of Interior, and it was created to manage all leasing on the Outer Continental Shelf for energy uses. This includes oil and gas leasing. They are responsible for all submerged lands lying three miles seaward of state coastal waters out to the exclusive economic zone, which is roughly 200 miles offshore. BOEM's first step in identifying appropriate lease areas is to announce a call area, which is a relatively large undefined area in the ocean. Um, BOEM asks states and communities about data sets, uses, potential conflicts, any interests or concerns about that area as a whole. And I've given kind of a rough example of a call, what a call area looks like on this slide by using black boxes. You can see up in the Gulf of Maine and there in the, in the mid-Atlantic off of Delaware. After BOEM receives all of the input through comment periods, it begins a process of inputting all available data into a suitability modeling tool, which helps to winnow the call area down to draft wind energy areas or several wind energy areas ultimately. These are marked on this um, image by the orange lines. The final lease areas then are carved out of the draft wind energy area and the final wind energy areas. And on this map, the final lease areas are the fully colored, area, uh, colored in areas that are closer to the shoreline. Each stage of this winnowing down process has public comment, public hearings, and TNC spends a good deal of our time and effort during this process to make sure BOEM is using the best available data for its decision making. It's also important to note here, I think, and relevant that unlike offshore wind development in Europe, especially around the North Sea, which is a very different process from the United States, once a company acquires a lease in the United States, they have no corresponding permits to build anything. They have no definite buyer for the energy. They have no guarantee of transmission access or connection to the grid. In essence, they have a lease and a rental payment to the federal government. Everything they do in that lease area from that point forward is subject to permitting, contracting, negotiations, and further public process. Next slide. This is just a quick screenshot from the BOEM website to give you a sense of the lease areas off the coast of Delaware, Maryland, and Virginia, and the wind energy areas in the orange outline where further leasing is planned. There are roughly five different companies with leases in, this, in these adjacent areas, and these projects are at all, all at different points in their relative processes. And my um, colleague Judy is gonna talk a bit more about the Coastal Virginia Offshore Wind Project and TNC's uh, role relative to that project. Next slide. So we have an upcoming lease sale, but it's very small. You can see um, orange, the orange area that's listed as A, which is about 100,000 acres, um, and the brown area um, that's labeled C, which is 176,000 acres. And just keep in mind that 100,000 acres can support between one gigawatt and two gigawatts of wind. So between these two areas, we think we're looking at about a max of four gigawatts. And keep in mind that um, you've, you've had a look at the state goals. Maryland, Delaware, Virginia, North Carolina, and New Jersey are all competing and interested in securing wind energy from these very limited lease, lease areas. Um, next slide. You're gonna hear some great and more in-depth information from Judy and Emily about how TNC has been working on offshore wind. Um, but I want to close my, my remarks today by saying that TNC recognizes the incredible need for renewable energy, especially offshore wind in the fight against climate change. We also understand that all energy projects bring impacts and risks as well as opportunities to do things better. So we use our incredible in-house science expertise to help decision makers avoid impacts, to help collaborative science bodies at the regional, national, and global levels find better ways to collect data, share data, and innovate as we learn. And we have been a thought leader in conversations related to the use of nature-inclusive designs at wind turbines and designing for biodiversity enhancement. 
We engage with the federal government and state agencies at every step of the siting process through construction. We inform monitoring and adaptive management, and we comment um, at public hearings and during, uh, in written comments throughout. We work very hard with great expertise to ensure the best outcomes for people and nature and the success of offshore wind. And I'm really looking forward to hearing Judy um, share with you the incredible work that they're doing um, in Virginia. Um, and I'm looking forward to the update as well. So thanks, Judy. Thanks so much, Trish, for that um, for that background. Um, so um, as Lori already introduced me, my name is Judy Dunscombe, and I'm the Senior Conservation Scientist for the Nature Conservancy in Virginia. I work with Trish and Emily as part of the Nature Conservancy's Atlantic Coast Wind Team. Um, <clears throat> and I'm here to talk about our understanding of the potential conflict between offshore wind development and biodiversity conservation and what we're doing to improve that understanding. Um, also, as Lori mentioned, I've been working at the intersection of energy development and biodiversity conservation for over two decades and on onshore wind specifically for about five. So um, although most of the work I'm gonna show you is associated with the Coastal Virginia Offshore Wind Project, it is still very relevant to Delaware. Both Virginia and Delaware are part of the Mid-Atlantic Bight, which is that sort of central section of the Atlantic coast on the US. Um, we have similar coastal nearshore and offshore habitats and species. So not only are the lessons that we're learning at CVAO directly applicable to sites across the Mid-Atlantic coast, but it's also the reason why we're doing this work in the first place is to learn and rapidly disseminate um, information about what conflicts may exist between offshore wind development and, and species of conservation concern and really in, initiate rapid adaptive management. Um, you can also see from this map that Virginia and Delaware have fairly similar levels of wind energy development. So a, a lot in common. So the first thing I'm gonna do is talk about how um, our Virginia team, just focusing on CVAO, how we evaluated the threats to biodiversity um, from that project. And then I'm gonna move forward to a discussion of research we're doing to fill critical information gaps, um, specifically around birds and fish. And finally, I'm gonna wrap up with a few resources you may wanna explore on your own um, after, this, after this webinar. Um, next slide, please. So when we're encountering a new technology or trying to get to work in a new place, the first thing we always want to do is think about what is at that place that we're trying to conserve and what are people doing um, in that landscape that could cause an adverse impact on those things. And so specifically um, with offshore wind and it, in this in the in our near shore and offshore environment, we we have a set of things we call conservation targets that we look at. And we you see seven of them. Um, it is seven. Yes, it's seven of them um, in the list to the left. So um, we're concerned about birds and bats, fish and sharks, marine mammals, sea turtles, sandy shoals and swales, live bottom patch. Those are hard um, bottom habitats that are interspersed within the otherwise fairly sandy habitat um, off the coast and also seagrass beds. Um, so uh, next slide, please. Or yeah, there you go. Um, so uh, this is my, um, I had to throw one illegible slide in because otherwise you might not think that I really was a practicing scientist. So uh, this is um, a spreadsheet that we put together where we evaluated all the different part, all the different things that happen during the construction and operation of a wind energy project and how those different activities might specifically affect critical aspects of the light his life history of each of these different species um, or groups of species. And we reached some conclusions about um, what we thought we really needed to be concerned about and what we we felt like we could um, was well handled, that there were it was well understood how to mitigate those impacts and that the process of mitigating them was likely to be observed. Okay, so uh, click again. Um, so two things that we're really concerned about, um, during the construction phase of development are fish and, and sharks, but we, we really have focused on fish and then also marine mammals. And this is um, largely because of the noise um, that occurs during construction and also the vessel traffic that occurs during construction. Um, and then uh, one more click, please. 
Um, we're also concerned about birds and bats really during the operational phase of the facility when the turbines are rotating and then that that area that's known as the rotor swept area um, is a place where there is pop potential for collision between certain birds and bat species and also um, where it might just cause behaviors like avoidance um, that that could have a, a, a cost to those species. So I'm gonna I'm gonna talk about birds first, and then move to fish, and then I'll have just a, a couple of well, actually I'm gonna speak speak to marine mammals first. We are not focusing on research on marine mammals um, at the Nature Conservancy. The impact, the the tension between marine mammals and offshore wind development is pretty well understood, and it's also heavily regulated. So um, there are protections. We we know that basically, especially for North Atlantic right whales, what what causes harm to those whales is entanglement in fishing gear and uh, uh, vessel strikes, ship strikes. So um, regulators like like NIMPS and NOAA and BOEM are looking really hard at um, the permit requirements that wind energy developers have to put in place when they are building their facilities. Um, also using uh, what they call bubble curtains to sort of mitigate for the noise impact of pile driving. So this is a, a space where the impacts are fairly well understood and um, there isn't a lot we can do prior to construction. There's not a lot to add um, to what we know. So we're not, we're not, it's not that this isn't a, a concern and doesn't need vigilance, but we feel like the science is well in hand and the managers are kind of on it and we're instead focused on places where there are data gaps. Okay, so next slide, please. Um, so I had birds and bats on the previous slide, but really when we zoom in, we're really thinking about um, a specific group of birds. So um, I think uh, Lori mentioned red knots and piping plovers. We know those are coastal birds that are important in Delaware. They're also important in Virginia and adjacent North Carolina, but those are birds that mostly migrate along the coastline and they're not gonna be affected by wind energy development that is happening um, in federal water. So this coastal Virginia offshore wind project here, which is that gray rectangle um, on the top uh, of the slide, that is, um, that's 27 miles offshore. So we're not expecting to see interaction between those species, but what we are expecting um, is that some of the migratory birds that migrate long distances um, between the east coast of the U.S. to winter in South America, those are the birds that we're really concerned about. So if you could click, please. Um, so previous studies have shown that um, particularly Wimbrel passed through and near the lease area during both spring and fall migration. This is research that we did um, back in the about 2015, 2016. Um, and then we have also a, a set of bird, um, a, a species of bird called Willet that nests in our marshes um, and breeds there. Um, but we don't have any high resolution migration data for that. And most critically, what we really need to know is what is the altitude at which these birds are flying? So we know that Wimbrel fly through those areas, but we don't know at what height. And that has everything to do with the, the risk to those birds going through that area. Okay, next slide, please. So, um, so we have a research project and the objective is to determine the roots of these southbound shorebirds and evaluate their potential exposure risk. Um, and the way that we've been doing that, you can see on this on this um, Willet here, we've got a, um, a, a a data logger, a data tracker, and we're actually pushing the edge of technology here um, that are actually glued, super glued onto the back of these birds. And um, the the one that you see here is um, has a uh, is is a data logger, so that we have to be close to it in order to download the data. Um, but there are other ones that um, interact with cell networks. So we can upload, once the birds are in range of a cell network, they can upload, uh, the, their data will automatically upload to that and we'll receive it and we can see where they've been. So we've got um, 30 Wimbrel tagged over the course of two fall migration periods. Um, and um, we're aiming to get 60 um, Willet over the course of, of two breeding seasons. So this is what we're trying to get so that we can really see what these birds do. All right, next slide, please. Oh, and this is the team. I need to say that um, the Nature Conservancy is doing this work in concert with the Center for Conservation Biology at William and Mary, and we absolutely could not do it without them. And they are um, tremendous conservation partners. Okay, next slide, please. Um, so here's some fun um, data. So as I mentioned, we have data loggers that um, you have to 
get, capture the bird and or get close to the bird to recapture. And then we also have cellular tags. So this is the one willet that um, that has a cell that has the cell tag. So it 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 sh its data got uploaded, and we can see what it was up to. So you see this this route um, that it takes. They fly for days over the open ocean, come down to that coast of. South America, um, and then use this is sort of a typical pattern where the the backward the migration route back to the U.S. is takes a more southerly turn. Um, so, but I want to zoom in. So, click again. Um, one of the things that's also interesting and um, is that this bird. Um, so we know this bird flew over the wind area. We don't know yet what height because uh, we haven't been able to analyze this data. We just got it pretty recently, but we do see that it did this false start. It went out and then it turned around and came back. And we don't know exactly why, but we do know that multiple birds um, during the migratory season last year were affected by um, Hurricane Idalia and Hurricane, um, I can't remember the name of the other hurricane that was bad, that came in the late part of the season, right during the, the critical bird migration period. So we, we know that we had significant mortality events to some birds during this during these hurricanes and, and those hurricanes that were, are associated with the super warm water that we're experiencing over the Atlantic. Um, and so that 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 is one of the pieces of evidence that we know that global warming itself, that the, that the warming of the ocean is actually causing harm to these birds. So um, next slide, kind of to Trisha's point about how climate um, is, is a very significant threat to biodiversity. Um, this is the pattern um, that we see from several wimbrel um, that we that we tagged, and you see they have a slightly different life history. They're still going, spending the winters in South America, but they um, take a little pit stop on the East Coast before they bounce all the way up to the Arctic where they breed. Um, I'd love to tell you more about them, but I'm keeping an eye on the time, so we're going to scooch and zoom in here um, again, and you'll see, um, an interesting story. So when we have more data, we can learn a lot more about what is going on. So we, what we can see is that some of the birds are flying through that area, but some of them are flying north of the area, um, the wind energy area. We also know that some of the birds are flying above rotor height and some of them are flowing, flying below rotor height. Um, and a few are, are kind of flying at rotor height. So this is why it's important to have um, a, a high enough number of birds and then do it over enough seasons to be able to really discern what 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 are what is the central tendency, what is the habit of the birds that that really creates that exposure risk. We're also really lucky because we were able to get this data before the wind turbines were installed. So um, they just started installation uh, last week. Um, so we'll be able to get after installation data, which is really the gold standard. We'll be able to see how these turbines are affecting um, those birds once once the turbines are actually up and running. Okay, I think we're about to move on to fish. So let's see what's in the next slide. Um, okay, so uh, first thing I want to say is that um, it, when we think about impacts, we tend to think of negative impacts, but an interesting consequence of the development of wind energy in our part of the Atlantic Ocean is the creation of this hard bottom habitat and, and this structure. Um, so the video that you're watching is actually fun from one of the two test turbines of the CVAO project. Um, and uh, in the first, uh, the first images you saw, and they'll roll back again, were the bottom layer where it's cold and dark we actually have urchins and cold water coral. They're not in that picture, but we have sea star um, and other things. We also have some, some fish that are feeding on that rocky substrate down there, which is there for scour protection. So um, things colonize that hard surface, then things come in and eat the things that have colonized that surface um, and so on and so on. And so that you end up with big things like we have a barracuda that you can see, sort of a shadowy creature. There's another, I think there's a bigger boy who comes in um, in just a moment. So we are super curious about um, what the impact of this is going to be. Are we just attracting fish? Or are we actually going to see more fish breeding um, in in these areas of the ocean um, from these from these um, from the development of all this offshore wind? Um, but what we do know is that anglers absolutely love um, offshore wind turbines because the fishing around them is great. So we'll continue to look at this, but just a kind of the sort of an upside here. All right, next slide, please. Um, but as I mentioned, um, during the construction phase, there is also a, the potential for an adverse impact 
um, which is comes from noise. And noise comes from multiple sources. It's surveys, um, it's construction, it's uh, the vessels for construction, it's the driving of the piles themselves. And then um, there may be um, consequences from the sound dispersal during the operational and maintenance phases as well. So um, this, is, this is not an area that has been studied. Um, so next slide, please. Um, we have undertaken a project. Um, it's a collaborative project with NOAA Fisheries uh, to determine the response of resident and migratory fish to noise of offshore wind installation. Um, so this winter, um, the, the guy in the center is Dr. Brendan Rund. He's our fisheries uh, biologist. Um, uh, he um, worked with a, a cast of, of volunteers and other staff to install um, four passive acoustic monitoring stations at CVAO and nearby sites. And those are just monitoring all the time and they'll hear everything. You know, they, they will hear shrimp, they will hear whales, they will hear um, anything that goes on out there. But then we also have 28 receivers. So that's what he's holding up in that central image, um, which are um, anchored to the bottom by that heavy orange ball. Um, and then um, tag... Uh, um, 65 fish and 15 on um, some some whelk um, on that that stay on the ocean floor to um, so that we can see how those animals are responding as the project is built. Um, we'll we'll see how that response if that response is steady over time, changing over time, and then we'll be able to see what happens um, after the the construction project is done. All right, next slide, please. Um, and then just briefly, um, I wanted to share with you some resources that you might want to peek at on your own. Um, this is the marine mapping tool that uh, Trish mentioned this in her presentation as well. You can just Google marine mapping tool. This is open source data. You can plug in any wind energy area or lease area, and you can ask questions about what kinds of things are known to be present at the site. And um, the tool is designed to help you understand kind of the risk um, to the species at the site based on um, the density um, information that that is that we already have. Um, and then finally, in closing, last slide, uh, we also, I just wanted to make the, make the point that, um, well, share with you this Regional Wildlife Science Collaborative for Offshore Wind, which is a really unique collaboration, a worldwide collaboration of scientists, or at least on both sides of the Atlantic, um, looking at all those groups that I had up on that first slide from sea turtles to marine mammals to um, ocean, uh, pelagic birds, seagrasses, all the things. Um, and, um, all, and the goal of all of this is to rapidly learn, rapidly disseminate, and rapidly adapt to um, as much information as we can as we build, off, build out um, offshore wind on the Atlantic coast. So with that, I will turn it over to my colleague, Emily. Um, who will talk about Delaware. Good evening, everybody. Trent, if you could roll over. All right. Good evening, everyone. My name is Emily Neural, and I do the policy work for the Nature Conservancy in Delaware. I was so excited that Tricia and Judy were willing to join Lori and I. You can see very much what they bring to the table and how Delaware can tap into their terrific expertise as we work to get offshore wind done in Delaware. So my role is to talk briefly about what does it mean? And one of the key places that it means, what does it mean for Delaware? And one of the points that I wanted to make, Trisha touched on it, Judy touched on it, Lori touched on it, but just to bring it on home, we do know that if we do not reduce the amount of greenhouse gas emissions in our atmosphere, we are facing catastrophic challenges, including in Delaware. We know that by 2050, at current rates, sea levels will rise up to two feet. And by 2100, just the end of this century, sea levels in Delaware are expected to rise by up to five feet. We're going to lose the coast. There are things that we can do to work better and smarter to help reduce the impact. And one of those pieces is offshore wind. Um, I heard this during the debate on offshore wind at the state Senate the other day, and I wanted to share it. We apparently are considered the Saudi Arabia of wind in the region. And what that it means, of course, Saudi Arabia is famed for oil reserves, but what it means, and Trish touched on it briefly, but 
off the mid-Atlantic coast, there is an enormous shelf in federal waters that also gets a lot of wind steadily. So we are ground zero for good places along the Atlantic coast to bring wind power in. There's two pieces that are being developed, discussed in Delaware. There's Senate Bill 265, which is offshore wind procurement bill and a US wind permit project. Trent, if you could roll over, please. First, wanted to start with Senate Bill 265. That is a bill that's in front of our state legislature right now. And how did we get here? Lori touched on it, but briefly to reinforce it, several of us, including the Nature Conservancy, got a bill passed last year to set greenhouse gas emission reduction targets for Delaware, 50% by 2030 and zero net zero by 2050. Delaware as well, we're the only state in the mid-Atlantic from North Carolina to Maine that does not have an offshore wind procurement process, procurement framework. So how do we get Delaware to the party? I joke that Delaware is late to this party, but we've learned a lot of good things. And so there is a bill right now that is in the state house that was developed with a combination of DENREC, which is our state environmental agency, offshore wind advocates, experts, the Governor's Energy Advisory Council, State Senator Stephanie Hansen, who's a terrific legislator and wonderful on clean energy, as well as input like folks from us. Trisha and I met with the state agency and um, the state legislator, and we specifically asked for a couple things. Trent, if you could roll over, please. So what this bill does, it creates an offshore wind solicitation process for Delaware. It allows multi-state agreements. And Trisha, I'm going to ask your help to unpack that if we get a question about it. But what's really neat about it is it says that if Delaware wants to go in on offshore wind power as part of our grid, we can have agreements with other states, for example, New Jersey and Maryland, which can both increase the flexibility as well as the opportunities across our states. We also asked for and got in the legislation what we call conservation and mitigation elements. Judy did a good job of touching base on that. But what that essentially means is as you are looking at putting in offshore wind and bringing offshore wind to shore, we're going to require that any company that wants to do that has got to address conservation and mitigation elements. It sets a Delaware benchmark price. And as I said, I joke about B Delaware being late to the party, but on that upside, it means that we've learned from the experiences of other states around pricing offshore wind, and we're hopefully able to build into both additional flexibility and guidance into our bill. And in terms of the next step, this bill is out of the state Senate. It is now in the state house. It'll be considered between now and June 30 and is expected to hit the governor's desk after that. Trent, if you could roll over. The other piece that I wanted to frame, so there's two major things going on in Delaware right now. There's Senate Bill 265, and then there's the offshore wind bill. Sorry, there's the offshore wind permit process. So U.S. Wind has an area off the Delaware coast in federal waters that basically looks like it uh, Judy, or actually Trisha, you had it in your list that part of it touches Delaware, part of it is in Delaware waters, part of it's in Maryland waters in terms of where it goes. But the important thing is, is this offshore wind needs to come ashore in Delaware. And one of the pieces I really want to emphasize about this is with this U.S. wind project, it is separate from the legislation I just talked about. That legislation is about purchasing offshore wind and getting into the Delaware grid. The U.S. wind project is actually permitted through the federal government, as well as the state of Maryland and the state of Delaware. So if this project goes through, it's going to have an avoided estimated 139 million short tons of carbon dioxide every year if it's fully developed. The thing that's happening right now is our governor's office is negotiating a community benefit agreement. This is standard stuff. I recognize for folks that don't work in the power space, have community benefit agreements may be a new idea, but there's actually very normal, not only for offshore wind, but for multiple industries. And some of the things that are being negotiated right now as part of the offshore wind, U.S. wind coming ashore in Delaware, we're looking at $76 million in renewable energy credits, funding for dredging, funding for state parks, replenishment of the 21st Century Fund, $40 million in community benefits over 20 years, as well as financial benefits for ocean and bayshore communities. If you could roll over. 
final bit. So what is happening right now is that a state permit process has opened up because in order for U.S. wind to come ashore, the proposal right now is that they come ashore in the Delaware Seashore Park. And as you can see, there is a list of DENREC permits, state permits, that this project has to go through as part of the state process. I don't want to lose Trisha's point that I believe she said there's about 60 permits total that usually have to go through for something like this to occur. And so I really wanted to emphasize this piece as well. There is a state permit process, but there are all multiple other permits as well. So TNC will be working with Center for Enland Bays. I'll be working with Tricia and Judy and others to put together Delaware's comments. Our friends down in the Enland Bays have said that they would be happy to help out. For those of you who know Christoph Tolu, he's a great guy. And the permit information is due September 9, 2024. And Trent is going to put in the final announcements where if you want the opportunity as someone who wants to comment on the permits where you can get additional information. Thank you so much and happy to answer any questions. Thank you all, that was wonderful. Um, we've got a couple of questions to ask you and then we're gonna take a few questions from the audience. So. Um, Trisha, I'm going to start with you. And, you know, we know that there, there have been many challenges in the offshore wind industry. Can you explain to us what some of those challenges are and then share some solutions? To make sure I unmute myself. Um, sure. So um, there are actually a good deal of challenges. We've talked about some of them at a very high level. Um, in the siting context, Judy kind of touched on this. Um, there's there are the data limitations limitations uh, um, to our understanding about what the un, what the interactions are. Um, mit, the resulting mitigation is costly and time consuming, and itself can lead to project delays um, that have significant consequences for the project. And then overall, the complexity of the permitting process and the length of time which influences a lot of other aspects of the project. So some of that has been in the news more recently. It kind of really directly relates to project financing and um, project pricing. So um, the other challenge is that each state buyer has unique, so while the federal government is leasing and permitting, the states are buying. And they have unique bidding criteria. You heard from Emily about how Delaware has its own process that it's setting up. Every state along the coast has its own process, its own regulatory approach to, to buying um, offshore wind. So offshore wind companies need to figure that out and sort it out. And then of course, if you price a project today that isn't built for 10 years because of the permitting process, factors like inflation, and supply chain availability can undermine the economics of those projects. In terms of supply chain alone, which is something the United States is really focused on, we need miles of cable, turbines, foundations. There are lots of subcomponent parts that the US does not yet manufacture. We need crew transfer vessels, heavy lift vessels, wind turbine installation vessels, of which there are only three in the world right now, um, cable vessels. And we're going to need somewhere between 50 and 100,000 reskilled, properly trained employees um, that don't yet exist. So the whole workforce supply chain challenge is big. In the United States, um, we also have the Jones Act, which requires all vessels that travel from a port to a point in federal waters to be US flagged ships, which creates a challenge if you want to use a ship that has a specific um, type of function that we don't yet manufacture or make in the United States. And that's what we're seeing in particular with the wind turbine um, installation vessels. Transmission, I, um, right now we don't have the points of interconnection that we need or a grid, frankly, that's capable of moving all of the renewable energy um, to where it needs to go. We really designed our transmission system to move energy from um, the center out to coastal places. So it's not designed to bring in big amounts of energy from those coastal places to um, the population centers. Um, that needs to be fixed. So significant grid upgrades. Um, Lori touched on this at the beginning. There's lots of misinformation and in some cases disinformation 
um, about offshore wind and impacts that cause local op opposition that need to be addressed before projects can move forward successfully. But I do think that all of these challenges also present really, really tremendous opportunities. You know, for example, if we need data and we already have large expensive, expensive vessels that are offshore, maybe they can be fitted for monitoring as well as cable laying. Really thinking about the possible cross-sector collaboration and uses and the needs that can be met and designing offshore wind to create habitat that may have been lost or to provide new habitat. So having um, aspects of the project serve multiple functions and respond to multiple needs is something that TNC is really interested in innovating around. And then of course, investing in or in vessel infrastructure and encouraging offshore wind companies to invest in communities by training local workforces is gonna be a big, um, these are gonna be big opportunities to really shift to create not only a just transition, but shift our economies to blue economies um, in ways that the community has informed. So um, I think lots of good things on the horizon there. Great, thank you so much, Tricia. I'm gonna ask Judy a question. You talked a little bit about data collection. Can you let us know where do you see opportunities for more data collection on offshore wind? Oh, Judy, you're on mute. <laughs> I was I was so into it and I didn't even notice. So um, thanks for the question, Lori. Yeah, the um, there are there's so much more that we can learn. Um, and, and again, we have to be uh, disciplined in our approach because we want to make sure that we're that we're answering the highest priority questions. But um, uh, more information, more one thing. There, so there's two things I'm going to say that I think are are important areas. One of them is coordination among uh, different places that are looking at the same thing. So, for example, we're looking at um, the response of fish to noise um, here in Virginia. We also have an opportunity to look at that or amplify certain studies that were done um, in the New England area. So um, it's the same question, but by by the more times that we sort of replicate that study up to a point, we're really, we're able to validate our findings and make sure that when we make a recommendation for how to avoid and minimize that impact, that that is a good and solid recommendation. The other thing is, um, is around the migratory bird piece, again, is coordination with others. So um, I only showed you the data for the east, Eastern East Coast population of Wimbrel, but there's another population of Wimbrel that come up through the Gulf. Um, and so we're coordinating with uh, Nature Conservancy folks in the in, and other researchers in the Gulf of Mexico to understand um, how their birds are moving as well. So that as we get, so we can pool all this information and understand the population level effect um, that that offshore wind development is is having on birds. But then just finally, the the last comment I'll make from that slide, um, th this is really um, one of the most amazing scientific efforts that I've ever been able to be a, a very small part of because scientists from um, like from Europe, um, we work regularly with scientists from Scotland, from Germany, from um, the Netherlands, who have all been thinking about these questions um, in the North Sea. Um, and and then um, we are working with scientists up and down the East Coast, um, and as I mentioned earlier, the Gulf, to ensure that we're really um, focusing, we're working together in concert. And I've just never seen this many um, scientists so committed to working together to prioritize and, and answer, and then, you know, funders really stepping up to make it possible for us to answer these questions so that this, you know, there's, it, it really makes me actually really optimistic that we could get this right, that we could have this really large scale um, build out um, in, in a novel habitat, but really do it in a very focused and conscious and intentional way so that we're, so that we're able to minimize those impacts. Wonderful. Thank you, Judy. Um, Emily, I'm going to ask you about the role of Delawareans. And so what are important next steps for Delaware and how can I make my voice heard if I am a Delawarean? 
Sure. So one of the things that I wanted to highlight tonight was we did some survey work in Delaware last year and found out that 70% of the Delawareans we surveyed were either supportive, very supportive or supportive of offshore wind. And we were very excited to find that out. And it is really important for people's voices to be heard. So there's a few different ways they can do it. At the end of tonight, Trent is going to pop in the final round um, to go to our Delaware website and look at what's going on with Delaware Wind, particularly if people want to make their voice heard to their state legislator around supporting Senate Bill 265, the bill that will bring offshore wind procurement to Delaware, as well as Trent will put information in the end about how to comment on the upcoming permit process as well. One of the things I really appreciate about this tiny little state is I think we're good at listening to each other. And um, I think it's really important for people to to participate, to ask questions, that to recognize that everybody has value as part of this conversation. Wonderful. And with that, I'm going to um, turn it over to ask some questions that we've gotten from you, the audience. And so we're going to first start with, um, this is a question I'm going to direct to Judy, and it is from Teresa West. Um, how do you tag the birds does it hurt them? And will you remove the tags after you get the data you need? Just unmute, Judy. <laughs> Thanks, I appreciate the question. Um, so um, we work very hard to make sure that the birds are not stressed or harmed in any way um, during the tagging operation. So we have to, all of the folks that handle the birds are certified um, in this work and they have permits from the our, our Department of Wildlife Resources and it's consistent um, in states um, across the East Coast that you have to have those certifications and permissions to, to be a bird bander. Um, the, the, both the willet and the rimble are captured in the marsh so um, there was a slide that showed a picture of Maria, one of our bird techs, actually netting the willet. Um, but uh, for the wimbrel, we actually lay um, netting, mesh netting uh, in the marsh um, and that they get tangled up in. But we, our, our bird techs are out in boats scanning the marsh. So as soon as one of those birds gets um, tangled up, they are right there to release them. Um, they um, move the birds to an air conditioned space to attach the, the, the transmitters. Um, the transmitters are attached with super glue, which I know seems creepy, but um, it does the job and uh, it doesn't interfere with the movement of the bird at all. And then the, the, the weight of the transmitter is carefully calibrated to the weight of the bird. So um, Willet and Wimbrel are both pretty big birds, and so they can carry comparatively bulky packages much more than you could do with a, a little a little songbird, um, which uh, we just use little nano chips um, to manage them. So a lot of uh, very careful, very protective measures. And then um, no, we don't remove the tags um, uh, because that is just additional handling of the birds and can cause you know more stress. Um, sometimes uh, when the birds molt, the tags might might release themselves, but um, they're designed to not interfere with the, the movement or the activities of the birds in any way. Perfect. Thank you, Judy. Um, this next question is from Bob Zimmerman, and I'm going to direct it to Tricia. Um, you've described very well the scope, criteria, and assessment that would, would be applied in the siting and operation of offshore wind and energy generation facilities. What would guide and govern the management and oversee where the transmission and consumption of the energy generated would occur? Let's start with that part of the question, and then I'll, I'll add the next part. All right, this is a very sophisticated question, Bob. Um, and I think, I think it's the right question to be asking because, um, it gets to kind of the heart of one of the big challenges for, for offshore wind, which is, you know, first transmission. So remember that the, um, the company that acquires a lease does not automatically get transmission access. They have to negotiate that. They have to figure it out they're competing with adjacent companies for limited points of interconnection along the coast. And then if those um, points of interconnection are not adequate, um, typically the um, 
the regional electricity operators. So in New England, it's ISO New England. In um, the um, Mid-Atlantic, we're, we're looking at PJM. Um, these these um, electricity service operators um, are the ones that make decisions about who, who has to bear the costs of upgrading um, the points of interconnection or the, the grid capacity to allow the, the energy to come in. And typically to date, I would say 100% of the time, those costs are being borne by the generator. So in other words, borne by the rate payer, they're carried through the price of the contract um, to the um, to the rate payer and not shared at writ large by the taxpayer. Um, these kind of nonprofit electricity system operators make a lot of decisions that are really kind of outside of the public view about how energy is moved through the grid and what type of energy comes comes in at what points. Um, and we could probably have a whole web webinar about this, but um, I can give an example of ISO New England, probably a, close to 20 years ago now, made um, offshore wind fully dispatchable. So in its real time, in the real time energy market, what that means is that offshore wind is on equal footing with other sources of energy like gas, coal, and nuclear. And offshore wind is considered to be a variable um, baseload source. So there's a lot of evidence that if we um, if we are bringing offshore wind into the market as a as a variable baseload and we're treating it as a fully dispatchable form of energy, that it is actually going to be able to displace um, and eliminate existing fossil fuel sources. And a lot of that, but again. You know, I said a very sophisticated question because there are a lot of moving pieces and a lot of different components to that process. The Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, the Department of Energy, the state's public utilities and energy offices, and then the regional system operators are all, all have different responsibilities um, related to transmission and how the grid works. And it's very complicated and um, challenging set of problems that we are dabbling in because it's so important to the success of offshore wind. But thank you for asking the question. I know I didn't fully answer it, but I would be happy to um, try to engage on this at a, at a different level in a different space. That's great. Thank you, Tricia. Um, so I'm, I'm mindful of our time. And I want to just say there have been a couple questions in the chat regarding whether this um, webinar will be shared. So we are recording this and we will share it on our YouTube channel. So stay tuned for more information on that. But at this time, I'd like to really thank our panelists, Trisha, Judy, and Emily for a wonderful and lively discussion. Um, as you can see, these issues are very complex, but they're critical for us, not only in Delaware and the first state, but beyond. And we're so grateful to our uh, incredible TNC's team and their engagement on this really important topic. Thank you to our audience for spending part of your evening with us. We're putting links right now for further reading in the chat, plus our social media handles, so you can visit any of these links for more information. Um, stay tuned for more updates on offshore wind by visiting nature.org Delaware. Thank you all again and have a wonderful evening. <laughs>